Hello, and welcome to Take Back Time. My name is Penny Zanker, and I'm your host. And I am super excited today to talk about this augmented reality with David Rose. I mean, a lot of people are talking about the future of work and what does the future look like. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to get a glimpse of that. Uh, let me just share a little bit about David's background. He's an MIT lecturer, author, and serial entrepreneur. He uh, is a five-time five entrepreneur, draws on culture, design, travel, and music to envision the future products and businesses that are sparked by the next generation of technology. And uh, his book, his last book, The Enchanted Objects, is a definitive uh, book on designing of the Internet of Things, the Internet of Things. Interesting. And he has a number of other very interesting uh, books out there. He's also wrote a seminal patent on photo sharing uh, and founded an AI company focused on computer vision and was also a VP of vision technologies technologies at Warby Parker. So we're gonna, we're, you guys are in for a super treat today uh, with uh, David Rose. Hey, David, welcome to the show. Hey, Penny, thanks for having me on. So we're talking about, you know, the, the future and what the future looks like and, um, you know, I, I find this very interesting. A lot of people are talking about this, the future of work and, you know, the, the fear of that, you know, we're going to not, not, we're going to, so many jobs are going to be eliminated because of AI. Like it, it feels like there's a lot of fear about what's coming in the future. And I, I get a lot of excitement from you. Like I, I get to feel that there's a lot of really interesting things, uh, for us to think about and, uh, that can replace that fear. Um, what's what's your general like are you positive about the where the future is going and how technology is is guiding us or are you you know gloom and doom like where this is all going to take us over if we're not careful i'm i try to be balanced although i think i'm naturally optimistic um i mean i think what i write about, about in my most recent book called supersight is about how these technologies will really help evolve how we see. So in the same way that we've been using glasses forever to kind of correct our reading prescription or visual acuity, we're starting to be able to mix what we see with the naked eye with virtual layers that allow us to see differently and, and actually visualize faster. So one of the projects that I talk about in the book uh, that I'm working on is something that helps us see uh, sustainable landscapes in a way that we wouldn't be able to see today. So if you just look at a lot of homes, they have kind of wall-to-wall -wall grass, you know, floor to wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in grass. <laughs> and uh, it's not good for the environment. You know, people use a lot of chemicals to take care of their grass. Uh, it doesn't capture a lot of carbon, uh, requires a lot of water. A lot of states are getting people to pull up the grass and put something else in, but they don't do it because they don't just don't have that imagination to see what, how the lawn could be different. And so we're using augmented reality so that you can just hold up your phone and see shade trees, natural pollinating bushes, outdoor furniture and lighting. Um, and obviously there are companies like Home Depot and Lowe's that love that kind of ability to have an instant of redesign of some part of the world and then have people kind of become inspired to make a change that's both good for the value of their home and also good for, you know, those retailers that want to sell you things. Yeah, that's, you know, that's hugely valuable because uh, like in envisioning a house that needs work, you know, I know a lot of people will not buy a house because they can't envision what it could look like if they just put just a little bit of work in it, a, you know, a fresh coat of paint, uh, take a wall down here and things like that. So it's very interesting what you're saying is that we could put a phone up over some of these different applications to help us to see what we're not seeing uh, to, to get the best out of out of environment. What are what are some other applications of that? That's that's fascinating to me. Well, I mean, what's happening with, with this, the company Home Outside that's doing these uh, kind of algorithmically composed uh, reimaginings of people's landscapes is 
you need a system that perceives the world. So phone cameras and increasingly LIDAR, which is built into the phone, um, and then a 3D engine that kind of does the imagination part for you and, and composes a scene in a new way. Uh, to give you this kind of vivid data layer on top of the real world. Uh, like those are those technologies are built into phones today, but one of mm -hmm. the reasons that um, I'm really excited about the category is that increasingly they're being built into glasses. So when I was at Warby Parker, uh, my job was to kind of think about how what the future of technology enabled glasses could look like that not would not only, you know, change and become sunglasses when you needed sunglasses, but also have AirPods embedded in the temples. Sure, and I've have, seen I've seen some of those. Yeah. Yeah, right. Bose makes some. And then also do the kind of mixed reality uh, future where the in, new information is kind of glued and grounded on the real world. Um, I think what we're seeing now is in terms of just kind of efficiency, the, the simplest use case for this is uh, navigation right i don't know if you have you tried the new google um uh view ar view where you just hold up the phone and it kind of puts big signs on the world and allows you to see through the camera and then says like you might be disoriented because you just popped out of the subway but this is the way you need to go in order to get to your next meeting um you know that's a very kind of situational awareness application of the technology um but I think the next one that's really coming is, is uh, collaboration, where, I mean, how many times have you um, held up your phone to share your view with somebody else so that they could say, like, this is how you fix that, or this is how you adjust the, you know, the thermostat. I saw a plumber that came to my house the other day, and he was doing that with a more experienced plumber who is not at the house <laughs> saying, like, how do you fix this Kohler faucet? Like, that kind of um, remote collaboration and telepresence uh, certainly is coming into healthcare for like dermatology, but also to just like so many situations where you can share your view of the world with someone. Right. And then ideally they can, they can annotate on the world and, and their marks stick to the world. Well, and it's real time, right? We kind of have YouTube where people share their screens of how they're doing stuff or whatever but that's seen after the fact right so this is this is live and collaborative in nature right so that's the difference like you know these, these little tweaks as to how things change so am i understanding that yeah. correctly it's like a uh you know we before the thing we were talking it's kind of like a, a ways kind of collaboration where people are sharing information so multiple views even of the same thing can be coming in at the same time yeah, I think that has that brings a lot of efficiency for people because not all the experts have to be present in order to for you to get advice on that, you know, 5% of the project where you really need a couple of other eyes mm -hmm. on whatever you're designing or fixing or um, repairing. And it might be the kind of most dangerous part of, or of the job when you're up on the pole or uh or down in the in the water or whatever whatever you're doing, you know, I think that's that's kind of how it promises to reinvent the future of work is the, you know, you can kind of distribute expertise in a more ad hoc way. So if we were to say, you know, to better understand that, so like somebody, I forget where I read this, but I thought it was very interesting. It, you know, it was talking about like the, uh, you know, how um, collaboration how it's how it's grown and morphed right so from uh the i'm trying to remember they were talking about in in um ah, drawing a blank so wikipedia is an obvious but i'm i'm thinking one step earlier than that that there was um a reference that i remember somebody had given and maybe you have some thoughts about this and then you've got wikipedia where everybody's bringing in their knowledge right you had Unix and all these like open source type of software that people are creating. So there's a lot of interest in this, in this sort of free collaboration space, right? Um, how do you see those types of collaborations or, or companies, major projects? How do you, how do you see them um, opening up to, you know, collaborate outside of their own company? 
Like, is, is that something that, that you see here or is it more of a, a public sharing? Like, you know, well, where I you do, see that going? yeah, so I, I do see that there are, there are many new businesses that are kind of parallel, parallel with what's going on in healthcare today, where you have um, the kind of getting a consult from a dermatologist that used to take moving your body into the healthcare system, waiting in a room, um, uh, and uh, now you can do in you know less than five minutes, you can kind of get a diagnosis and a prescription of kind of whatever you need very quickly. Um, but I, I think that same kind of uh, fast, you know, remote telepresence kind of use case kind of works in a gig economy as well, Penny, like, like you say, where it's not only people within your organization, but if you want to do some pair programming with somebody, you want somebody to kind of beam into your situation to help you with a, a repair or a shopping experience, um, that kind of help will be kind of more available uh, in a way that's just in time and and the you know the switching costs are much lower the friction costs are much lower when someone can just beam in that's interesting i guess what came up for me is you know what's the you know when you talk about it in the glasses mm -hmm. you talk about it in in the glasses and getting this real time um is the the idea of how does AI play a role in like, you know, cause I could envision like what comes up for me is, okay, you've got multiple views. Like how, how does, how will AI be integrated into this to, mm. to, to, to sort of supercharge it from, from what we already see today? Sure. Well, I, I think AI is really required for, for uh, powering the perceptual system where you know, when you look through your glasses, you automatically are scanning the scene and you have a scene understanding of what's happening in front of you. You have a depth map, you kind of know what, what's where. Um, and in order for a computer to be able to kind of see what you see and perceive what you perceive, there's a, a computer vision technique called semantic segmentation, which basically just means every pixel in the scene is labeled by the computer. So it knows um, for example, we're going to boating application right now, and it knows in the scene in front of you, as you're looking out of the front of the boat, like what is water and what is sky and what is a small canoe that you should not hit <laughs> a kayak, a jet ski, not only what is what, but also what is heading in which direction and what, and represents... what speed and all of that. Yeah, kind of right. Thing. And what represents risk. So all of the kind of self-driving car technology, which is trying to create uh, real-time un seeing understanding of what's around you to figure out where to navigate and to go and what people and bikes bikers to you know to avoid um, is coming to our glasses as well so that will will help us read other people's emotions it will help us know everyone's name it will help us to quickly come you know at a conference to understand what are the commonalities between uh, what, why you're here and why I'm here and how to approach you. Like we'll, we'll have rapport faster. So like we'll for a sales perspective, you're saying I could be, I could like look at you and I could see in my glasses, your personality type and, and some word suggestions on things that would create rapport between us. Like, wow. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to get all of that from your face. It could know that you are Penny and look it up on LinkedIn and say, well, the, the bizarre hobby that you both have is, you know, you were both, you both grew up in rural North Carolina and you're both into kiteboarding and like nobody else in the room is into those things. So there's this idea from, uh, from data science called least common commonalities. And it turns out like those are the things that create the most rapport the fastest are that the things that that exquisite party host does when, when they say, David, you should meet Penny. Both of you guys are interested in blah, where, you know, where it's like some interest. Obscure, you know, like, yeah, yeah, obscure thing that, that draws you both together. So I think 
I mean, in terms of conversational scaffolding too, it can kind of give you tips like you're dominating the conversation or ask her more about this, or, you know, here's a good empathetic follow-up question <laughs> or reframing. My wife is a psychotherapist and has lots of good techniques for, uh, for, for people in conversation. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wondered, like, do you feel like you're being analyzed all the time? <laughs> I am. Yes. You are. <laughs> um, so this but, has, but do you see how that, you know, this has incredible, um, potential in, in a lot of areas to, to help us to, uh, when, when we come back to the idea of productivity, right. To get to the core of what we're looking to focus on and get there faster, right. Achieve rapport faster, achieve, uh, you know, uh, our, our creative ideas faster and so forth. What, um, you know, what are the side effects? Like that sounds mm. good, but maybe I feel like nobody's genuine anymore because, you know, maybe you're just, you know, you're, you're really just seeing this to manipulate me. Like, do we, do we then live in a society where we don't feel like people are authentic or, or what, what are some of the side effects? I, I mean, I think the definitions of authenticity are already sliding right? Like when you remember people's birthdays, when you answer emails using crystal on LinkedIn, that tells you like, oh, phrase this in a certain way, because this person really responds to data more than emotional stories. You know, we already have lots of tools that, that help us to engage, help us to engage on the right channels with the right types of messages. Um, I feel like it's just a big level up for a lot of us. You know, like, is it unfair to get to a party with a GPS? No, is you know, you're just more likely to get there on time. Like, that doesn't seem like an unfair advantage. Um, but and... you're not like manipulating anyone. Like, I do think that as a society, and I have no proof about this, so I'm speaking out of my butt on this. But I feel like people are more critical um, because of all the ads that follow you, and and you know, is this person genuine? And people are contacting me left and right on, on LinkedIn saying these things that they don't know me and they don't really care to know me. They just want to pitch me. Like, I, I think it's created a lot of, um, that the people are more critical. They're more apprehensive. So I'm just curious, does this make it worse? I think it gives us more tools and those tools I think can be abused, but I also feel like they can you know, ChatGPT can help us like get to a first draft faster that we can then make our own, you know, like get kind on of gets, it. Yeah. it kind of lifts all boats to like a C level. Uh, and, and hopefully that will lift the A levels higher into, into, yeah. into higher levels as well. I mean, I think there, there is this notion in uh, computer vision that's the opposite of augmented reality, which is diminished reality. So this is when the AI can see what's in a scene and automatically, you know, mask certain things from the scene or swap out certain things from the scene. And I think we all need, in many situations, we need a little bit of diminished reality just to, you know, just to just to apply some focus. Like if when I go, I have um, two kids in my family that are uh, have allergies, and if I go to the grocery store. I do not want to see like 90% of what's at the grocery store because it, <laughs> it's not because it has gluten or it has dairy or it's not kosher. Like right. there's like a bunch of filters that I have to apply. And I would just love to not see the things that I shouldn't be buying because it's going to hurt somebody. <laughs> you know, it's going to run into somebody's allergies. So I think that's like a good use case for diminished reality. And I can think of lots of negative use cases for diminished reality too. But I think it will kind of give us the strategic blinders that a lot of us need in order to um, focus on the right things at the right time. So, so what would they look like? So the shelves would be empty except for the one thing that I'm looking for. Is that what it is? So as I walk in, like the shelves are empty. I look like I'm in a place by myself. Well, Penny, like nobody's designed this yet. Like that's kind of the exciting part Oh, this part is of like, this okay, whole, this like, is projecting. Like, yeah, I mean, nobody, I created an app that that um, allows you to pick up something. It's called Better Choice. And you you put your phone camera on it and then it swaps out the one you should be holding in that category, like the granola that you should be holding because it matches your your allergy profile. But- Oh, I love just, that. That's just one way of doing like a search and replace um, in the world. 
but I love that it's it, called better choice. Yes. Yeah. It's just a prototype. We're just, we're doing it with whole foods. Oh, uh, well, um, keep us posted on that. I love that idea because that has so many positive applications, right. In terms of mm -hmm. what's, you know, what your goals are, if you want to, you know, you might have allergies or it might be, you know, that you can swap out and find something that's within your allergenic, uh, um, range, right. but or, also or made you know, locally. calories and healthy yeah. and milk substitute. Like that's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. So it's kind of a, a, a faster way to get to the right thing. I mean, when I was so at work, could it Parker, also be also... when I'm watching TV that it says, comes across and says better choice, <laughs> get out and do something <laughs> exercise. Maybe. I mean, I think we kind of don't like a lot of those nudges, so they have to be tastefully done. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting. but I do I mean I guess the meta the meta comment about that is I think if you're a product manager or you know kind of interested in innovation and design this whole field of like how do you mix the real world with virtual layers how do you augment how do you diminish like all of that is a brand new design space that is really exciting for a lot of people who um you know, maybe, maybe you're just a, a web developer today or a mobile developer, like this will be the next platform for computing that will be the next 10 years. And there are lots of tools to kind of start prototyping, um, like Adobe Aero is one, Apple's Reality Composer is another one. Um, and I talk about these, these are for developers, kind of tools and techniques. Well, I teach workshops and those those tools are simple enough that there's no coding required. Okay. You just go to the asset, you go to 3D asset stores, you anchor this over images or over videos or over objects or in GPS, GPS locations in the world. Um, okay. And you can start to kind of experiment with how to how to morph the world around. Yeah. This is so interesting. We could go on for for a long time here. Let me let me back up a second, and then and then uh, we can bring it around, wrap it back around uh, productivity, and and maybe that's around collaboration. But how do you define, you know, with your augmented reality brain, um, you know, how do you define productivity and why? I. I mean, for me, as I'm working on projects that involve diverse teams of people that are making physical hardware, like oftentimes we're doing a camera system, like we're doing a camera system right now for boating that sits on top of a boat. And it has like hardware, software, computer vision, algorithms, um, some connections to people that make, that make boats, uh, some connections to people that understand uh, GIS software. I just want to get to the the team that has the right knowledge in order to come together to make something extraordinary, extraordinary fast. So the way the biggest variable there is the finding the right people who have the right expertise and finding the right tools and the right data um, all at the same time and all quickly. <laughs> so <laughs> that's to me the Okay. The big, so that's the, the definition, yeah, the, right? It's how, how we find uh, the right team, uh, the right tools and the right data at the, at the right time, right. To create something extraordinary. So how do we yes. do that? Like, you know um, what's, and, and maybe you've already said it and we're just kind of summing it up. Like, what do you think is the best way going forward to, uh, to achieve that? Um, I think we still need better uh, expertise location, um, which is how do you, how do you, you know, LinkedIn is is a way and GitHub is a way, um, but there still needs to be kind of better tools that help organize the who knows what and how do I. How do I find that team member that I need for this for this two weeks in order to build a special computer vision classifier that's just good at differentiating between waves and boats? You know, <laughs> like that's what I'm looking for today. But uh -huh. I don't know the way. I mean, the way that I find them is I go. To, I look at um, 
academic papers and conference presentations and LinkedIn and who knows who. Um, but it's really inefficient. I mean, I, I would love a, a faster way of kind of navigating that tree. Right. There needs to be some sort of a platform dedicated to people who want to work on projects and categorize and classify their skills and these these major projects. Yeah, maybe I mean Fiverr is kind of trying to do that a little bit, but it does it usually yeah. doesn't have people that have doesn't kind of, it, um, yeah. computer vision skills. Yeah. Yeah, but it, yeah, but so take one of those types of platforms like uh there's some other ones that are out there too, right? That are that that have contractors, but uh, mm -hmm. but I guess you're talking about with a higher level of, um, you know, those are. Uh, I don't I don't know if they have this level of you know that really have like uh, 3D capabilities and that kind of stuff, but um, but I could mm -hmm. see that I could see that's where we're headed, right? Is there will be those specialized platforms where people will come to uh, to to collaborate. Looks like. It's like a project for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and then once you find uh, people, it's really hard to have them jump into a project, understand the goals, understand, um, like there's scrum methodologies, but it takes a long time to kind of spin up a uh, a Trello board with the with a team as people are just coming 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 in, um, right, and getting them onboarded quickly. Yes. Yeah. That's the challenge, I guess. That is the challenge. All right. Well, you know, I think then uh, we're up for the challenge. I think any, you know, that's anyone who runs major projects that are global, you know, comes comes in those types of challenges, right? As team members come and go uh, and keeping everybody up to date and moving forward and, you know, projects are uh, are are complex. So anyway, thank you so yeah, much I, for being I, here. Is there is there anything that I missed that you feel like you know we should we should cover before we uh, before we sign off today? Well, I mean, I, one of my hopes and visions for SuperSite is that other people can more quickly and kind of more agilely beam in to see what you see and understand, um, kind of in a more intimate way. Um, what you're doing, what you're challenged with, where you are in the world. Um, and so I seek this kind of holographic projection that uh, will kind of really change meetings. Like you'll be able to, rather than scheduling a 45 minute thing or a half an hour check-in, it'll be more like take a walk with me or observe what I'm observing. And we won't stick to this calendar in the same kind of rigid way that we stick to it now, but people, Meetings will be more like a few minutes, but many more times a day, and where you can just kind of pop in and out of other people's heads. Um, and I'm you don't want to go there because I'm going to tell you that's all sorts of uh, worse than what we have today. So structure helps people to focus. If people are popping in and out of other people's focus time like uh we already have that problem with multiple chat platforms and everything i think i think the burnout that you see today is going to be much worse in the future because there's no turning there's no turning things off there's no stopping people like i, I think they're i don't want to say death it, to meetings kind because of i think meetings on, provide a structure so i don't mean to like play the combative it's true but, i mean i do i do believe that meetings provide a structure but it depends on what you're trying to achieve and if you're if True. you're stuck if, if you're like need somebody else to just beam in and like look at a look at your code or look at the, the mechanical engineering problem that you're having right now and you just really need their advice um like the kind of gig economy model to get somebody to to look at that or five people to look at that in parallel and tell them tell you what they what they think um will help unstick you faster definitely and i think what you said earlier was the the switching cost and the transition cost comes down because you're very quickly into what someone else sees. So I could definitely see the value in that. Hey, I'm going to slack you. I need, you know, I need you to have a set another set of eyes on this, and then bam, the other set of eyes are there. So I could see that as really uh, expediting um, the process that already might exist today and just making it a lot faster. I just hope that it's used wisely and that we don't end up in a structureless um, 
uh, type of usage where you know it, it just creates like in the in the pandemic the multiple chat platforms is part of what's burning people out is they're constantly they don't know which platform they should be on there's no rules about where what's communicated where and i think that's part of what's left people kind of burnt out and distract constantly distracted it's true but if you're in a situation where you're up on a pole uh trying to, fix, trying to fix something or you're like boating through a narrow passage and you can't really control the time you need like a little bit of expertise right now absolutely um, that's very helpful absolutely well this was great i'm i'm excited because this opened up you talked about seeing what you see well thank you for helping me see what you see uh <laughs> it wasn't really something that was on my on my radar of thinking about you know the possibilities with AR AI. I was looking at different things and uh, how how we use our devices and glasses. And I just got glasses, so now I'm like you know part of the club. Um, so thank you for for opening up my eyes and everybody else who's listening today. Well, I hope you have good focus uh, in the next week. <laughs> thank you. Where can people find out more about you and and uh, and take a look at the books that you have? Yeah, so supersites.world is where people can learn about um, my background, they can look at the workshops that I do, uh, and uh, see some of the projects and see some design principles for if you're interested in designing something with AR. Fantastic. And all of that will be in the show notes for those of you who are listening and didn't get that down, you can check it out in the show notes. So thank you, David, for being here and, and sharing all that you've uh, shared today. I'm excited about all the projects you've got going on. You're welcome. Thanks for the conversation. And thank you all for being here because without you, we wouldn't have a show. Uh, and I hope that your eyes were open today and that you see some of the possibilities of the future and that you see also um, how you can, what you can do with it and how you can create it, but also how you need to use it wisely and in a way that's, you know, going to uh, create more productivity versus create more distraction. So like anything that we look at in the future. So thank you all for being here. My name is Penny Zanker, and this is Take Back Time. We'll see you in the next episode.